So listen, exciting uh, topic to discuss today. We're going to talk about something I think that we don't talk about all too often, which is hiring your first assistant. You know, when to do it, what to look out for, how to compensate them, all of that in today's episode. So I'll, I'll tee it up, boys, and then we'll we'll kind of unpack it all and kind of get your guys' thoughts on it too. So my the the first thought for me is, I think the question that we often get with agents that we coach is, you know, where should I invest? When I start to make some money, when I start to build my business and I've been doing it for a couple of years, where's the best place to invest my money? And the answer is always in, we should invest our money in areas that give us our time back to then have choices on what we can do with that time. And so for me, that means to have, to, to bring on administrative support as the first step in scaling your real estate sales practice makes all the sense in the world. Because the goal of hiring or, or delegating administrative tasks off your plate is so that you can raise your income. You can really scale your income exponentially. You can get all of the $14, $16, $17 an hour work off of your plate if you do it right which will allow you to do the four or $500 an hour type of work, which is to lead generate, lead follow up and meet with potential clients. And if we followed an agent around, those are the three things they rarely do. Because what we often hear is like, I'm so busy. And that's so busy, the, the busyness of our business, it's not that they're wrong. I, I know how busy you are. You're busy being the assistant because you don't have one. So um, I kind of get your guys' initial thoughts, and then we'll we'll go even, even further. Well, just like my initial thought, yes, they're busy being the assistant and or they're just busy being busy, right? Like they're, they're doing the shiny object thing. They're going to the networking event. They're, you know, tinkering with their website. They're not already focused on the right thing. So I think that's, you know, just key to start yourself doing the right things and then make yourself so busy being your own assistant that you then need to find one. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's real quick. Let me add something on that, Ben. I'll get your initial thoughts too. That's a good point, you know, because the assumption that that I just made is like the agent who's got their head down, they're doing the right things. They're saying no to enough things so that they can say yes to the right things. And they're 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 succeeding. They're doing it. Um, but they're capped because you only have so much time in the day. And oftentimes people that that don't do what we're going to talk about in today's episode, they end up burning out because they end up working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. All right. Your initial thoughts, Ben, and then and I want to get into the next point. Being an entrepreneur is is continuing to do the highest paying activity and working yourself out of a, a position. So I think like you've got to be doing everything until you can replace yourself so that you're always doing the things that move the business forward. And in our business, we all believe it's outbound prospecting. So, you know, there's a point where, you know, you, you just need to take a step back and say, I can't do what I need to do. Where often agents say, oh, I'm go I've got to go to the appraisal. I've got to go here. I've got to go there. I can't prospect. I didn't have time today. When in reality, it's like you need to take a step back and we talk about the rubber band effect and we can get into that. But so that you don't like you're only in business, you know, for a certain amount of time as soon as you pull the plug on prospecting. So it's like you got to keep that up so you can get off the roller coaster. And that's that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way the easiest way to look at this is is the medical field. It's the best analogy that we can pull into the real estate industry is like you look at any doctor or any dentist. We'll just look at those two for a second. The, the reason why the doctor makes the, the income that they make is because they're doing the, the, the vital few things that only they can do in their business. And then they right. delegate the rest. And so right. we see the exact opposite in, in the real yeah. estate business is the real estate agent is doing things that anybody could do and they spend no time doing on only what they can do, which, you know, our, our, 
you you nail it. Like our we're in the business. Like you you will get paid. Your income is a reflection of your ability to acquire clients. Mm -hmm. That's your surgery. That's your uh, filling cavities, so to speak. That's your like superpower. And so what we're what we're trying to do when we're helping when we help an agent try to grow their business is put them in a position where they can not only be the best at it, because there's one thing about being good at it, but then doing it, right? Like having enough time to actually do it. And so I think a lot of people get caught up in the learning how to do it, but then not having enough time to do it. So let's get let's let's get into the next point where you just said, Ben, which is the rubber band effect. All right, real quick, and then we'll get right back to the content. If you're a real estate agent, you're looking to build a listing-based business, a business where you can generate a multiple six-figure income, a business that doesn't require you to waste thousands of dollars on the new marketing gimmicks, then I'm going to invite you to click the link right underneath this video to learn about our Listing Agent Academy coaching program. This is a six-month intense coaching system that more than 3,000 thousand agents from every market all over the country have now gone through. And here's the reality. Here's the truth. I will shoot you straight. This program is not for everyone. This is for agents who value being around winners. They value being in a community of other real estate agents that actually show up, that actually put forth the work. And this is for agents that embrace high levels of accountability and visibility. To get the details, all you have to do is click the link beneath this video. You can schedule a coaching consultation and then you can decide for yourself. So with that being said, let's jump back into the content. I think for agents that have tried to hire an assistant, there's all kinds of limiting beliefs out there, all sorts. Some are, you know, no one can do it as better than, uh, as, as the way that I can. You know, these are my clients. I don't want them to say the wrong thing. So I'm not willing to take the risk or I've tried that in the past and it's just more work than it's worth, you know, and they don't understand the rubber band effect. So Ben, why don't you take a second, explain to the audience what that is, and then we'll get into it. Yeah. So to be able to move forward, we have to take a couple steps back because now we have to, which is a lot of times harder to explain something, break something down, teach somebody a system it's a lot easier to just do it yourself, right? Right. You think about, you know, I have little kids, so this analogy pops in my head. Teaching my son how to, you know, take the garbage bag out, get tie it open. shoes, whatever. Yeah, tie his shoes. It's hard, right? It's easier for me to just say, like, just give me that. Let me just That's do right. it. And then say, let's let's keep moving. Let's go on our bike ride or whatever. But if you can do that, now all of a sudden. I, he's trained and he's ready to go and I don't have to do that. And I can focus on something else. And well, let's, and let's just, stick with that. Comes more let, let, really good let's, analogy. Yeah. That's a really good analogy. Let's stick with that for a second. Let, let's stick with the shoe tying thing for a second. This yeah. is probably a really, this is a really good analogy because yes, you're right. Most agents take the approach of, well, give that, give that to me. Let me just do it real yeah. quick. Yeah. And if you keep doing that, the kid is 28 years old. And you can't do anything. You've actually handicapped both yourself and the child. Because yeah. before he goes on a job interview, he's got to run to your house, make sure you're home. You got to tie his shoes, right? And, now, and the child is the business in our situation, right? Yeah, yeah. And so this is the same thing for the agent who says, well, I can just do it better. Well, of course you can do it better because you haven't taught anybody else how to do it yet. And so the rubber band effect says, if you're going to make this thing work, we have to expect, just like you said, Ben, to go backwards. I always tell an agent, listen, your business is probably going to get worse before it gets better when you bring on an assistant because it's going to require you to develop that person to build systems, to build an operational uh, process around mm -hmm. what's in your head. We have to get mm -hmm. what's in your head, how you do it, all the conversations you have with clients, how you show property, how you list property, how you handle offers, how you upload docs to your broker software, so on and so forth. All of that's got to come out of your brain. It's got to go into a system so that somebody else can learn how to do it. Furthermore, I think the other big mistake is that a lot of agents expect people when they hire them 
to come right out of the box, ready to go. It's like the same yeah. thing with the ISA conversation, right? Yeah. And then they get mad at the person. Oh, this person sucks. And they end up, you know, turning and burning good people. Well, leadership 101 is like, you got to look in the mirror first. What are you doing to develop this person? No one, you, it's going to be super rare. You're going to find somebody, bring them into your world, and they're going to know all your processes. They're going to know your email provider. They're going to know your CRM backwards and forwards. They're going to know how you do everything. It's going to be super rare. And I think a lot of agents have that expectation where I'm going to hire an assistant. I should start to benefit the first day this person starts. And if I don't, then it must be the person's fault. Yeah. And I think the like the in-between step of that to, to what you're said, like just not only getting it out of your head, but get it out of your head. And then the next time you do it, follow your own steps that you made to make sure it kind of makes sense. Like create the blueprint or checklist for yourself. And then when you go through it as an imagining yourself as another person, be like, oh, this, I actually don't really need to do that. That's kind of silly. Or maybe I should flip flop these orders. So instead of just winging it yourself, like create yourself a checklist and then start to follow that. And then you'll be able to optimize it for when you bring somebody on. Yeah. So let's talk about the the process. Like this is the process that I think has worked the best for me. That that's an easy framework for people to follow. So you, so you hire somebody, and we'll talk about the hiring process and what you pay them, all that stuff in a second. So you hire somebody in your business. My my belief is that they don't they don't touch anything for the first couple of weeks. They just they're on your hip watching you as you do. Mm. They're just observing. So, so phase one is you do. You just do a bunch of stuff, Ben, and I'm just watching, and I'm learning, and I'm taking notes, and I'm asking questions. And then at the end of the day, we're we're debriefing the day. I'm kind of journaling the day. So I'm just shadowing you. I'm watching you do. That's phase one. Probably goes for about two weeks. Then phase two is we do. We do together. So the next time we input a listing, we do it together. Right, I'm I'm inputting this part. You're observing me. You're giving me feedback. We're doing everything together. We're we're uh, we're doing the photo shoot. You know, we're uh, together. We're giving feedback to the photographer. We're doing everything together. And then phase three is they do on their own, and then you give them feedback. So so they're alone. They're doing it on their own. And this is like a thirty to forty five day process. And if you can follow that simple framework of you do. We do, they do. I think that's an easy way to do it. You can't just throw them into the fire. I think this is the best, the easiest model to follow when it comes to like hiring somebody new into your team. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I love that. Yeah. Because you're busy. You're busy. You're running around. So for them to be able to kind of get somewhat their feet wet just by watching you do, you don't have to take a huge step back. That's right. Explaining everything from scratch when sometimes it's hard to, articulate unless they can actually see you handle it right and, they and learn my to thoughts, talk the way you talk and whatnot that's right and, and regardless of what they're going to do for the agent that it, during the shadow phase they should be shadowing everything mm -hmm. every conversation they should be going on every listing appointment every showing yeah. appointment at every open house it doesn't matter to which extent they're going to you know execute their role, have them have an understanding of the business so they can start to connect the dots. Oh, yes. I know why we do this because you're going to have a conversation later down the process about that. And so they can right. connect the dots, right? Yeah. And you it's know, hard to explain everything, right? They don't know all your little nuances from a listing presentation and how you make them feel. And if they have that perspective, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm building the car in the factory but I know how it feels when I drive it because you took me in one that's already built. Like you took me through the whole process. Front that's to back. right. So you have that perspective. Yeah. So, you know, when I think about, okay, well, the next question is like, well, where, where do I find such people? <laughs> right? Like that, that's another question, you know, and I'll give one resource that has really, really worked well for us. And it's a simple one. It's Indeed. I mean, Indeed has been phenomenal for, for a lot of years for us. You could put a small budget, like literally five or 10 bucks a day. No, not even that much. Five or 10 bucks a week or something. And you can get 40, 50 applications a week. It's insane. 
So, mm. so putting that aside, like that's the easy one. Everybody should have that on Indeed all the time, by the way. So you're just always getting inbound applications and you can say, wow, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think the best place to look, and, and this is where I want to get your guys' thoughts, is here's, here's what we know. And this is where I've gotten the best people is like from within the industry, people that find out real estate is a sales, a direct outbound sales role. And we know mm -hmm. that that is for like such, such, such a small percentage of the human race that great people get into this business, but only finding out later that sales isn't for them. Those mm -hmm. people are great. They want to be in real estate, but they, under, they, they find out quickly, well, sales isn't for me. And we're talking about that's probably 90% of the people that get into the business, but they'd be great ops people. They'd be great customer service people. They'd be great if they got paid a salary. We already know the stats, right? 90% of the people don't make it. The reason they don't make it is because of they're not salespeople. That's why they're not making it. So mm -hmm. that's the easiest way to, to find people is to look with inside the industry of people who say, well, you know, this real estate sales thing isn't for me, but I love the industry. I know the industry. I know the market. Um, maybe it's an agent at your brokerage who, who you, you could would be a great executive assistant if they knew the opportunity was there versus them leaving the industry. And so mm -hmm. for me, this is, I mean, this is how we find a lot of talent. This is how we find a lot of talent. Your guys' thoughts on that? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I, I think you, there's a little bit of things that like I would say to be cautious about. One is you have to hire the opposite of you. You yeah. can't hire another you unless that's what they want to be is a quarterback, the the listing right the the main guy um so a lot of times like we vibe with people that are a lot of like us and we want to hire somebody with our that's like us and that can be harmful because if they're an extrovert Absolutely. they want to always be on the appointment they almost can have some jealousy towards you because they're like i'm stuck in the office doing all this op stuff and i want i want to be on the appointment but they weren't able to lead generate versus somebody that maybe was willing to lead generate, they were willing to build the business, but they just realized like, hey, I like the detail of it. I like the transaction side. I'm, I'd am i rather be sitting in the office. So yeah. I think it's helpful speeding up, getting them up to speed if they've already been in the industry, but just making sure like it's the right personality fit, somebody that's gonna compliment you, pick up all your weaknesses, not compliment your, you know what I mean? Yeah, explain yeah, yeah. That, right? yeah. No, no, you, 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 you're spot on. We have to make sure that we're hiring. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, risks, I think is what you're saying, hiring a realtor because yeah. of maybe some ego, right? Uh, maybe sure. of some, some, they want the attention. So you got to be, be cautious of that. Like when you're hiring somebody who, who is a real, licensed real estate agent, yeah, you got to make sure it's the right person who, who, is okay saying, yeah, being a real estate salesperson is not for me. It's not what I want. And, and the truth is it's not for most, you know? Right. So you got to make sure that you're not, like you said, hiring somebody like you because it will be short-lived. They'll start yeah. to see all your success and say, oh, okay, well, thank you for teaching me everything. I'm going to go off on my own and I'll do this on right. my own. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're, we're talking about hiring somebody who, who has already come to the conclusion on their own that sales just simply isn't for them. It's like mm -hmm. the anti who they are. Cole, what are we gonna add to that? Couple, uh, the last brokerage, I saw this a couple of times, the way a couple of really top producers um, and some people who were, who were coming up, who were doing well, who were at that point where they needed an assistant. What they did is they went to the assistant of the top producer and just said, hey, like, who, like, do any of your friends mm -hmm. like do you want because they're going to be similar people like who else do you know that might yeah. want to do something like this and then even one of the like front desk people like yeah you know like and and they they ended up coming on because they wanted to get out of the the front desk type thing they had the personality they were kind of doing it for the brokerage but now they wanted an opportunity to do it for an agent so kind of just like asking around and talking to the people who have that personality already who are already doing it a, a few people found some good assistance that way as well yeah and and I've hired a lot of people in the past of like um, 
people coming back into the workforce, that's also another great place to, to tap into. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it was a stay at home parent and they're ready to get back into the game as a, you know, that's another really good pool. So if there's a, yeah. a stay at home mom or stay at home dad that you guys like, as the kids get older, they get back in the game and they're great, great people. Um, and so that's another opportunity. So let's talk about like, wh what is it that they do? All right. So I have been saying for years that for some reason, I think people are like, this throws them off for some reason. When I, when I say get your assistant licensed, they like have this disconnect. Well, it makes sense when you hire someone who's already licensed, but the reason you want to have your assistant licensed is eventually you want to get to the point where, like I said, at the beginning of the episode, all that you're doing is focused on the activities that generate revenue for your business. Those are prospecting, lead follow-up, and presenting, right? So everything else, everything else, eventually should be delegated to, if you, if you have the right person, they can handle it. Well, what am I talking about specifically? I'm talking about offer negotiations. I'm talking about inspection negotiations. I'm talking about appraisal negotiations. Your licensed assistant through your training, through your leadership can do that task because that is a, uh, I believe that is a revenue servicing activity. You already generated the opportunity. You're just servicing it. You already got them in the restaurant, right? And so I believe that that is a, a, a task that can be delegated and you see the top, top 1%. That is exactly what it is that we do is that we get out of those tasks because they can do mm -hmm. that. They're, they're doing all of your, your lead follow-up cleanup. So when you prospect, mm -hmm. you've got systems in place to make sure that the leads are getting their thank you cards. The birthdays are all getting dialed in the CRM. They're putting them into the right folders in the CRM. They're getting added on social media. You know, all of these different, they're, they're dropping off pre-listing packets, right? They're sending mm -hmm. out welcome cards. They're sending out uh, invites to to your 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 client events, so on and so forth. There's a laundry list of items. Maybe that's something Colton we can create and have as a PDF. We'll we'll, we'll introduce that later, not in this episode, but like a list of of tasks that your licensed admin should take off of your plate. And Ben, you said at the beginning of the show, you don't just give it all to them on day one. You're just adding right. things, right? Like, hey, this week we're going to add these two or three things. But I'm mm -hmm. a, a huge proponent of having your assistant licensed so that they can do so much more for themselves that benefit you. Yeah. Awesome it's something that. else that just popped in my head based on what you're saying is so often we see super successful husband and wife teams. Yeah. Because they both get licensed either together or you know, one the husband joins the wife who's crushing it and he just kind of takes the back admin role. Um, and they both have an owner's mentality. They both want to see it grow, but one is building the business on the backside. One's building it kind of on the face and just having that system like you're talking about and just following it, working together. Um, you just see those, these, these couples just crush it. Yeah. So let's, let's pivot to compensation. So you just said something that I had on my notes too, the owner's mentality. So I'm a huge proponent of, of compensating your admin like that, where, you know, they have some stability in some base salary or, or hourly, and then plus an upside based on how the overall business does. So they're bought into the overall success of the business. And so yeah. this is where I think a lot of agents get caught up. Well, what should I pay? I'll, so, I mean, there's yeah. a standard going rate right in every single market, you know, but, but the way in which I like to do that is to back into what that person can earn. And so if that person's going to earn 40 to 50 K a year, I mean, that's probably a, a good average of a great admin, right? Cause that person has got a lot of upside. I mean, they can work from home. They've got a flexible schedule. Perhaps you can back into it to say, Hey, I'm going to pay them. Let's just say 50% of that's going to be in base salary. And then 50% is going to be paid on how our company performs. I think that's a good place to start. And here's the thing I want to say about compensation. I think maybe some agents that approach having this assistant for the very first time, they're very scared, right? We talked about some of the, the limiting beliefs that they, they may have. Always remember this. You're not on the hook for an annual salary. You're on the hook for one 
pay period at a time. So as long as things are going the right way, and the right way is defined by that person brings so much value to your business that as a result, you make more money, then they should more than pay for themselves. So if you're going to pay somebody every two weeks, that's all you're on the hook for. You're not on the hook Mm -hmm. for 50,000. You're on the hook for 2,500 bucks, call it. Yeah. And, and that person should help to double or triple your income over time. And so the money that they make is a no brainer. You should be saying to yourself, how can I get another one and another one and another one and another one? Go ahead. What do you guys want to add to that? I, I just think it's mentally, it's like they're thinking I'm, I just made 150 K and I'm going to hire this person for 50, right. 75,000. How can I take a 50% pay cut? I don't have time to wait for this. But it's yeah. like, no, if they don't help you double or triple, you're out 2,500 bucks, 30 days. That's it. Maybe that's 90 right. days if you really want to feel it out. So good. Yeah. And, I, and I think too, like if you're as an agent and we talk about this all the time, like if you're just tracking your numbers even and you can forecast, like if you know you're on the phone two hours a day, you know, the last year you made $110,000, but on the phone you're worth 200 bucks an hour. Well, imagine if you just doubled that, you know, like you've just, doubled your income and so when you can look at it on an hour on hour basis like it's just it, it's hard to see into the future when you when it's not right now but having the numbers helps to forecast it too you both just nailed it so let me let me just start with colton's i just want to uh, add on that he's exactly right the whole you can break this down to the ridiculous you can break it down hourly if you are talking with seven people an hour on average right and right now, on your own, you're only able to handle 20, 25 conversations a day. Well, what if there was a world? And 20, 25 conversations a day yields you that $150,000 a year. Well, what if there was a world that the time allotted allowed you to have 50 conversations a year? And because of your ratios and because you're tracking your numbers, you went from 150 to 300 in GCI. You paid an admin to get that time back let's call it $58,000, $65,000. And that netted you another hundred and whatever the math, however the math, what is that math? Hundred other hundred thousand? Is that what it is? To go from 150 to 300 minus 50, though that's 250, that's another hundred thousand. Would you do that? Would you do, everybody would do that all day long, right? So that's what we're looking at. You could break it down if you track your numbers. The second thing that you said, Ben, that I love is every single time you hire somebody do a 30 day trial. Period. End of story. Hey, mm-hmm. let's do a 30-day trial. You may hate working with me, right? It's not just it's not just one-sided. It's two-sided. Let's look at this in 30 days and assess, do we think this is going the right direction? Do we think this is that this makes sense? And if you hate it, you could tell me. You're not going to hurt my feelings, right? It's just like mm-hmm. any sales conversation. And then also, this opens us up so you can give them feedback as well. Hey, here's how I think this is going. You don't want to wait 30 days to give the feedback, but just do a 30 day trial. You know, it just kind of, I think, brings the whole overwhelm of of hiring somebody, the stress of it just way down. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, Because, like, not only from the money part, like, oh, you know, like you said, they're like, oh, I'm on the hook for 50 grand this year or whatever. But even, even like, okay, well, I've got to pay this person next month. The other side of it is the emotional side of like, man, I'm like, I'm supporting this person and their family. And mm-hmm. if you can frame it like that, like, look, this, this might not work out, you know? And like, we're going to see if I'm a pain to work with or whatever it is, like they're not, they're not building their life around the next six months. Cool. I'm going to be making, you know, four grand a month, whatever. Like it, it yeah. kind of puts everybody at ease. Yeah. I think expectations is everything, Right. And, and having those up front to say, listen, we both have a responsibility to making this work, right? And just like we said at the beginning of the episode, the responsibility of the entrepreneur, in this case, we'll call them a leader, they have a huge responsibility hiring somebody, like from, mm-hmm. a, from a leadership perspective, right? We talked about, you're not going to just wave a wand, meet somebody off Indeed, offer them a position they accept, and then on Monday, they're just a badass. They just start providing tons of value. They're just... Now, it's going to take some time. So having that expectation and then being open and honest with each other when you hire somebody to say, hey, I really want this to work, but it requires both of us to show up, both of us to provide value to one another. And if we find that it's not, the second we find out that it's not, we have to be open and willing to tell each other the truth. 
And we've got to mm -hmm. set that expectation from, from day one. And then one more thing on the compensation thing. I think so many oftentimes people do the virtual assistant thing and they put yes. a little bit of money in and, and we touched on this, like the power of having somebody in, but the compound effect of having somebody where you're getting what you're paying for, right? With somebody there understanding the nuances. But then what you said, which I really like and wanted to go a step further on is the like the gradual ability to make more because if they are going to take over negotiation they want to really push for the deal to close because then they benefit from it you benefit from it they can see that overall picture versus i think we want to dip our toe in and say i want the cheapest option and then i want the best results well you're never going to find somebody that can replace you but I think if you can find somebody at at 80, 75% of your ability, then it's like just rinse and repeat, replace, replace, replace yourself. Um, and that's how you can really scale. Great point. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. You know, same right. thing here. And I like the way you said that. Most agents are like, how can I outsource, 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 cheap, 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 cheap. And then at the same time, want world-class results. And if they don't get it, that company sucks. You know, let me go to a different company. Right. It's ridiculous, right. you know. I, I I would I would argue the fact of like even if you had like bring somebody on part time, but in person mm -hmm. that sits right next to you in your office. Mm -hmm. I bet mm -hmm. you if you had someone part time, let's just say you pay two thousand dollars a month, twenty five hundred dollars a month, which is the same. Maybe you can get a virtual ISA. That person right next to you is going to way out produce that person mm -hmm. that's wherever country for the same price. And there's little incentives that you can do that we just underestimate the value to people. And yeah. right, like all the millennials now are joining companies based on culture and incentives, but things like that, that we've talked about in the past. So something I did before was, you know, there's, there's Christmas stuff, but like send them a cleaner to clean their oh, yeah. house, make that part of their composition you know, salespeople working towards like earning something like a Rolex, right? Versus or a trip or a cruise. And they will work their tail off for that thing. Even, but if you gave them an extra five, 10 grand on their income, it wouldn't have landed the same right. way. Yeah. So it's like these extra incentives that you can add on where you can create a relationship with somebody, a culture on your team that they'll never want to leave and the value of having somebody for a long period of time that learns you and your systems inside and out like is invaluable compared to spending you know an extra two three hundred bucks a month for them to have a cleaner because they that just feels different it's an emotion that versus just a dollar no doubt no doubt and the whole culture thing and and how to create that from a leadership perspective another episode but you nailed it i mean you nailed it it's like that's part of leadership that I think a lot of newer entrepreneurs just don't understand. They don't understand culture. They hear the word. And our and our yeah. industry is great at throwing around the word culture. But if you yeah. ask somebody, okay, what is your culture like? Explain it to me. What what do you believe culture to be? You know, people are like, uh, uh, uh they, you know, they can't even get into it. So anyway, awesome stuff today, gentlemen. Appreciate it. And um, we'll see you guys on the next one.